dialogue. So here we are, all these years later, and uh, the world kind of coming back together, but in a, you know, in a different way. I think it's so incredible that people from so many different places now are interested in dialogue, and also that there's this technology that can bridge people in such faraway places that we can converse and we can learn together and that we can progress together. Now, I also know there are a lot of people online who could just as well be doing this production. And so I humbly share my thoughts with you and hope that as I leave things out, that when we come to the end of my part, that you'll share those pieces that I should have said and didn't think to, or insights that you've had or questions that you, that you have. So I also will tell you, this is my first time doing such a training on Zoom, and thankfully Linda is my going to be my rescue person if I screw up here. So I'm going to push share screen, and hopefully we'll come up to where I want to go. So hold on here. All right. So share screen, and then I want to go to slideshow. <coughs> We made it. Yay. Big sigh. Okay, so here we are at an introduction to dialogue, and I want to share with you first just a little bit about how I'm going to walk through the presentation so you feel like you've got some roadmap to where we are and where we're going. So just a little bit to talk about David Bohm, because some of you may not be familiar. Uh, well, So just a little bit to set the stage so that we start from the same place. Then I'd like to give some description of dialogue. And I, I tried to go back through Bohm's own writing. One of the things I found about dialogue is that I think every one of us who takes up this practice of dialogue tends to put our own signatures on in terms of the way that we share it and present it. And sometimes it kind of takes some interesting bends and turns. So I wanted to go back to the source itself and put together what I think as just an introductory piece, maybe what David Bohm would suggest that we talk about. So we'll talk about some definitions, what is listening, fullness, and fragmentation, thoughts, and then meaning. Then I've got some suggestions about when we might use dialogue and then some specific examples of where I've used dialogue so that you get some real practical pictures of where it might fit for you. So that's kind of the roadmap, and so let us begin. So first of all, who was David Bohm? Well, for those of you who don't know much about him, David Bohm was an American theoretical physicist. He was born in 1917, died in 1992. That gives you right there a little bit of hint about David Bohm. He lived through two world wars. He lived through the great, the great dynamics in the financial markets um, in the early, in the 30s. He lived through the Vietnam War. Actually, he, he was also a person who was quite controversial in all of that. So in the late 40s, early 50s, David Bohm was actually exiled from the United States. He had become deeply embroiled, in, along with some other scientists in that time, in the whole dilemma of McCarthyism and the, the great fear at the end of the Second World War about the relationship we were building with Russia. So he, uh, at the time that all this was happening, was a professor along with Einstein at Princeton. And as a result of a lot of the political goings on at that time, he was, he was exiled from the United States and he lived most of his life in various countries, Brazil, um, Israel, and then in England, and lived most of his life then not being able to come home to his home country. But yet, he and Einstein were very, very close. He was in a generation behind Einstein. And Einstein considered him to be of 
such genius that he was the one that would be able to go beyond relativity theory. And that gives you a sense of the incredible mind of this person, David Bohm. Oh, and he also was considered by Einstein to be his spiritual son. So he had a very, very deep connection. That kind of gives you a sense of the realm of thought that this man occupied. A lot of his work was controversial. It hasn't necessarily been easily accepted because it was just so far out of where most human thought goes that, that it just wasn't as easily understood probably as we would like to think it could have been. There's still major studies going on. Uh, there's a, a study going on right now at, the, at King's College in London that's doing some very deep research into things that he came up with in the 50s. So that gives you a sense of the, how forward thinking he was that we're still unpacking things at this late date. So uh, the unusual part of David Bohm, and partly this comes out of his having lived through such world wars, but he also was the child of two Jewish immigrants to the United States. So in his growing up days, he lived through a lot of things that really set his ideas towards how the world needs to deal with difference in a better way. So he held a very deep sense of social consciousness and also a very deep sense of how it was that um, how it was that we needed to be able to broach the world of science and the world of us common mortals. So this is the picture I like to share to kind of put an idea on what I call his quest. This is an old, old woodcut that I think is probably from the 16th or 17th century. And this guy is looking under the curtain of the universe in some way, the curtain of known thought. And I, this is what Bohm was out there for. He really wanted to look beyond the level of our normal mortal consciousness and be able to say, what's out there? You know, what, what's out there in this bigger consciousness of the world or of the universe? Now, he wasn't religious, so he's not looking at this as a spiritual quest per se. He's looking at it as a scientist and saying, if we can break out of the mold of thought that keeps us stuck, what would we be able to see out in the broader universe? What are those laws of the universe that are so way beyond us that we're inhibited by the way that our social thought has taught us to work? So this is another picture that I think talks about his intent. That is, he wanted to be able to bridge between science and the way that most of us think. He had a great commitment to saying science should be in the hands of us normal mortals and we should be able to understand and make sense of it. Now, I have to tell you, trying to read his work, I don't think he quite got there. <laughs> so I think he left a lot for the rest of us to work on to make it as understandable as possible. Now, in his social consciousness, he also... Uh, his, his biographer uses the term agonized. I was really fortunate for several years to have David Peet, his biographer and his uh, co-author and his co-theoretical physicist work with me. He was my mentor. So I used to hear all sorts of Bohm stories. And this one was that Bohm just agonized. He would worry and worry and worry about how to put his science to work for societal betterment. And here's, a, here's something from one of his books. Bohm says, people say, all we really need is love. If there were universal love, all would go well, but we just don't seem to have it. So we have to find a way that works. So he thought that if we were left to ourselves, we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't find the way that works and the way to peek under that curtain of the universe to able to communicate with it. So he said further, he said, the challenge that's facing humanity is unique. 
Now keep in mind, he's writing this in 1987. What would he think today? I mean, in his day, babies less than a year old don't already know how to make their parents' cell phone work. Or we don't have robotic vacuum cleaners like I just bought. Or we don't have the number of specialties in the world of science. And you, know, you don't just go to cardiologists anymore. You go to cardiologists with specialties. So clearly technology has passed way beyond where we were then. But even at that point, he's saying that we have to have some new way of thinking about what's going on. We need a new kind of consciousness. We may all want to get to a place where the world works for most everybody. Uh, but in fact, the, the route to get there might have to be somewhat different. But the things that worked before may not work now. So now he said, then what are going to be those tools that we use to change the system? This picture I put together as an organizational development consultant. And for those of you who aren't in that field, these various terms may not make sense, but what I'm trying to portray is those of us who work at any kind of change, it can be change in a family, it could be change in a nonprofit group of some kind, it could be change in a formal setting or in government. We all have tools that we use. And the question is, what tool do we, do we want to put together here? when we have some kind of issue that we're trying to deal with. So here are the various kinds of changes, change tools that I learned. You could substitute your own. But here's the difference that I think David Bohm was trying to get us towards. So there's, there's really kind of two big clumps of change issues that we need to deal with. Some of them that, you know, they could, again, be any kind of organization, but some of them are ones that the tools we know tend to work for. But we all know there's cases where the groups we belong to have issues that seem to be under the surface, and there's nothing that seems to work there. Now, let me give you an example of that. Um, well, in fact, the next slide, I think, gets to that. So here's, here's what I think Bohm was kind of talking about is the tools that we normally have are like the tools that will work on the top of the iceberg, but the majority of the tools are under the surface or, need, or the majority of the problems are under the surface and those tools that are in our toolbox don't tend to work down there. So let me give you an example there. I worked for quite some time, a year long, as a matter of fact, in a dialogue project in a long-term care facility that had both care issues and had uh, some real administrative issues. One of the issues was absenteeism. They had to employ one and a half nurse to keep one nurse on the floor They had such a high absenteeism rate. So you can guess that was really a huge cost issue. And the HR and the OD folks had done everything they could think of to figure out why are people not showing up for work. So we did a lot of dialogue on that topic. And one day, there was a guy who came in who he happened to be head of maintenance. But we had, we had organized these dialogues to have somebody from every different grouping there. So this guy that's head of maintenance came in, and he said, he was just really tearful, very uh, close to crying, which is very unusual for him. He was very stoic as a rule. So I asked him, so what's going on with you today? And his response was, well, I just learned that Mr. Jones died last night. And I said, well, who's Mr. Jones? He said, well, he's a patient. He's been a patient here for a long time, but he said, I visited him every day for probably five years now. He was like a father to me, and I just learned that he died. There was kind of a silence, and we're just very respectful of the grief he was feeling. And then one of the nurses said, you yeah, know, some days I pull into the parking lot, put my car in park, 
And I sit there for a moment with the motor still running, and I think, who's died since I left my shift yesterday? And then somebody else said something similar, and somebody else said something similar. And you know, all these tools that we had been using to try to diagnose the problem and not gotten to the fact that the issue under the surface was that the care staff were having to deal with the grief that came up as people died there. So we had been trying to come up with solutions that were for the wrong problem. And it took this way of being able to talk in safety and to dialogue in safety to really surface the real issue. So again, that's just an example that some things are above the surface tools for issues and require the above the surface tools. Some things need a different method to get the lead beneath the surface and really bring up what the big issue might be. So where does this come from? We credit David Baum, lots of us, for the initiation of the process of dialogue, but in the research that I've done, and I've gone back through a lot of the history, and um, I think that, uh, is, it Laurel? is it Laurel that's with us, Lauren, or Laurel? I'm sorry, I didn't get your first name quite right. Lauren, she and I probably have a lot to talk about here. But as I've done some background tracking on this, uh, I've come to think that dialogue is really a built-in capacity of the human mind, that this is as old as human life is on the planet. We see it show up in a lot of uh, pictures and, and writing that talks about ancient civilizations, and really a lot of the Native American traditions are based on people sitting in a circle, talking and talking and talking, until it seems to be that the real issue needs to be addressed arises and with it some creative solutions. So this is as old as we are as a species. Now what would it look like for those of you who haven't participated? This is a picture I took from an online site that was a dialogue being done at Brandeis University. So usually there'll be say 15 to 25 people sitting in a circle. Now why sit in a circle? Well it's because we have so much more direct evidence of what's going on with people. So you see when somebody scoots their chair back kind of in defiance or in an automatic response when something was said that didn't sit well with them. Or you see when somebody gets sleepy. Or you see when somebody's face, is, face flushes or whatever. And you also hear everybody. You're in direct contact with, with all the forms of communication that are going on in the circle. Now why that number of people? And some of the research that was cited by early uh, developers of dialogue, when you have a group of people that's lower than around 15, they said, what you tend to evoke are patterns that come from our upbringing, bring up family dynamics. So you tend to bring up, like you would have in a family, you've got some authority structure there. You've got parents and you've got kids. So you bring up authority. That's, that's just naturally there. You can bring up things like sibling rivalry. You can bring up competition. You can bring up fighting over whose toys what. So any of you who worked in an organizational setting will recognize some of that, that um, family dynamic stuff that comes up. Now these same researchers said if you got between 15 and 25 people, it tends more to evoke that kind of tribal quality sense. There's not so much hierarchy. Generally, there or often there maybe isn't even a hierarchy. Uh, people are more prone to listen. There's more opportunity to be heard as a group. Uh, so it's, it's much flatter. And then as you get higher than 25 or so, it tends to go back to the sense of developing a political organizational sense that's needed in order to have some specialization and some division of labor in a larger group. Now it's best when you have some diversity in the group. So the more diversity, the better, because we're trying to tease out how people think about an issue. A dialogue session usually lasts maybe 60, 90 minutes, and that's about as long as it takes to really get into the conversation 
And also by about 90 minutes, people are tired of sitting in the tends to wane a bit. So I've done dialogue in groups that just have met once, and that has some real utility. I think those of you who are organizational development consultants will, will know that it, it can fit into a program of, of other strategies you use. But for a dialogue group to meet over time and people get used to each other and create safety, that's where you really start getting into this under the surface uh, opportunity for things to emerge. Usually a dialogue will start with a trained facilitator who understands how to help make it work. But then as the group becomes familiar, that facilitator generally melds into the group. I have found that more difficult in a corporate Hold. So quite often I have found that oh, I do need to stay in the facilitator mold. But if you've got a group that's ongoing over time, quite often that, that, that's easy for the facilitator to just become a group. So in most settings in this day and age, the focus is on having some strategic question or common interest that the group organizes around. So there's already to start with something in common. These last three bullets, or the last four, just really hang together here. The real purpose of a dialogue isn't to make a decision. It's not to find a, a solution. It's to explore and to really get under that surface of thought that keeps us from coming to the real dynamic issue that's under the table. Uh, it doesn't ask for people to agree or change their minds. It asks them to learn to deeply understand each other, and to really go for listening, understanding, watching what comes up for you so that you're understanding what's under your own surface that gets provoked during a dialogue conversation. So I'll give you some other descriptions of dialogue. And these, uh, I, as I said, I try to take directly from bone. So, but I have to laugh. This, this was the flip chart that I drew the first time I taught a dialogue course, and that was in 1995. And to tell you what a hoarder I was, I still had the whole set of flip charts rolled up in my garage. So I unrolled this one and made a picture of it. I was trying to describe what the intention of dialogue is. I called it group coherence. But in this picture, if you look at the top set of arrows, they're going in every which direction. And I think as we participate in groups, that's kind of like us. We're headed all over the place. So we may think we're on the same ground, but unless we really query into it, what we find is, is that we're just all over. So the bottom set is what the intention of dialogue is. It's to train us all to get into do north. So we're all focused with a common awareness. It doesn't mean that we all think the same. It means that we have the same pool of understandings so that we can find a path forward eventually. So that's what I call coherence, is when we're all headed in a due north direction. So here, here's the official kind of uh, description. It's an intentional and sustained inquiry. So we're really in inquiry, questioning, in the unspoken assumptions, certainties, rules, and processes, that's the end of the table stuff, that guide our actions as individuals as a group. So it's the idea that all these things that we've learned, all of the assumptions that we hold, operate under the surface of consciousness. We aren't often even aware of why we respond the way we do. But as we become able to put those up in front of us, it gives us choice for more decision making and therefore what it brings about is more of shared meaning so that we can be more coordinated. David Bohm liked to call it organizational glue. And this is this is part of his proclivity. Bohm loved to go into the etymology of words. And so here he's done it for us. He says there's a difference between discussion and dialogue. Discussion, he says, comes from the same roots as percussion and concussion, the Latin word cotere, which is to shake up or to strike, break things up, to analyze, 
and the process tends to create winners and losers. So we've got to have discussion and we've got to have analysis. It's the question of when do we want to be breaking things up and making finer distinctions. On the other hand, dialogue comes from the words logos, which means word or meaning, and dia, which means through. So in the group, what we're doing is we're building back those broken up things, those broken up fragments of thought, so that the meaning begins to flow through the group as a whole. And something new comes together. So discussion breaks things up. When you're in a discussion, you're making things into smaller and smaller distinctions. When you're in dialogue, you're building those distinctions back into a sense of wholeness, meaning of wholeness. So just a few then key ideas about dialogue. And these, you know, you could, we could talk about lots more. I think these are the ones that Bohm most emphasized. So the first one, listening. Um, Tacey, this is, this is one that you might already be much more expert than me. But what is the power of listening? Now, Bohm thought that listening is not a passive skill, that there's an active listening that actually forms the basis for information to flow. So it's a very powerful form of participation that's, that in fact is very active. But here's a quote from, from uh, two authors who are very close to dialogue. He said, have you ever noticed what happens when you really listen to another person? You listen without even intending to respond? Most of us listen that way only rarely. In ordinary conversation or group discussion, our response usually begins to form well before others are finished speaking. So we miss three quarters of the conversation that's going on because we're on the inside trying to figure out how we're going to rebut or how we're gonna put something else forward. So in a dialogue sense, I think if there were one skill in my, in my sense that gives us the most uh, boost in our relationships, it would be that of listening. The second idea, and this comes largely from David Bohm's sense of science, is that of wholeness. Now keep in mind, he's a theoretical physicist first. And his idea was in dealing with the universe itself as a whole. And he, this is his quote, if you take a great enough whole, then it's coherent. That is, the universe as a whole is coherent. But also when we get off track with each other, it's because we've broken the conversation down to a small enough increment that we can't anymore see the wholeness of what's going on. So his idea with dialogue then is rebuilding a big enough sense of wholeness that we can see the whole pattern. Now conversely to wholeness, he liked to talk about fragmentation. And this picture I found was a perfect example of the way he liked to talk. He said, if you took a watch and you took a hammer and you smashed that watch, then what would happen would be that where previously you had a system where the parts were in interrelationship with each other, once you smash them, what you're doing is you're breaking the relationships so that they can no longer function together. So here's a picture that I drew one time when I was teaching a course on dialogue, and I was trying to show the idea that what happens when we fragmented our way of thinking and participating one would have said the fragmentation is what causes us to have nations, economies, religions, value systems. We need those, but we also need to bridge beyond them. So in this picture, I was trying to show somehow the network of connection between the little threads that got broken and the purpose of dialogue would be to re-thread those, to build those little broken places so that the wholeness could have been functioning. Now, what is the, the behind all this? What, what gets broken in actuality? Well, he said it was the idea of thoughts. It was the, the whole function of thoughts 
that tend to get in our way? How do we, we, we have to have thought to think. So what's the deal? He used to actually joke about there's a difference between thoughting and thinking. So thoughting is something that comes out of the past. So thought, he says, is that under the surface stuff that shows up in terms of assumptions and opinions and we tend to think that the problems are in the outside world. They're, they're external to us. But the question we have to ask is, what about that process which is constantly making the wrong decisions and letting those relationships out there erode? What's going on deeper down? So he says, yes, those crises are out there. But the real crisis isn't in those events. It's not wars and crime and drugs and all this other stuff, it's really that there's a problem in the process of thought itself. So he liked to talk about pollution of thought. This picture is one that comes from a citizens group who were concerned about a stream that was polluted. And Bohm said, well, you know, if you want to fix pollution in a stream where it's being used for drinking water, what you could do is you could find this place close to your your public water system where it's where it's uh, polluted, and you could try to put together technology to get rid of the pollution. But on the other hand, you could go upstream and figure out what's polluting it, and that would be that would be a much wiser solution. So he says, let's go upstream. Well, what's upstream? It's that under the surface process of thought. Um, and I've forgotten which one of you it was that said you came into this learning from Krishnamurti. Well, this is one place where Krishnamurti and David Bohm really did some deep work together. Our thoughts are like little cookie cutters that have become so unconscious to us that a lot of times our values guide us in a way that we don't even realize it. And therefore, these things become identified with us. They become our sense of necessity. If these thoughts or these underlying assumptions are treaded upon, we feel that we are endangered. We become so identified with them that we don't separate our true self from what those thoughts would be. We don't even recognize the thought. So we become wedded to our paradigms of thought and they drive us without our recognizing it. David Bohm liked to use the term necessity a lot, the difference between what's contingent and what's necessary. But he also liked to talk about what's, what's between and what's beyond. And he said, a lot of times when we're in difficulties, we want to negotiate. And what negotiation means is that we're finding a solution that takes part of the side of one group and part of the interest of the other group and blends them together. But in the process, there's a whole lot that both sides still believe or hold that haven't been met. And so the solution never really works. He said, what we really need to find is a pathway beyond. Carl Jung used to say, we don't solve our problems. We grow beyond them. And so what Boom is saying here too, it's by becoming aware of those underlying assumptions we carry that allows us to look at them and grow beyond them because then have some awareness of what it is that guides our behavior. And he called that fresh perception. He said that there's such a thing as being able to look under that curtain of consciousness and be able to participate directly with the intelligence of the universe. Now, again, he was not speaking as a religious person here. And he's actually speaking to something that all of us have participated in. We all have assumptions. There was Archimedes who was in the bathtub and shouted Eureka when something came to him. We have insights. And he's talking about insight writ large here. He's saying when we're able to break through that boggle that our, percept, our, our built in assumptions and opinions give us, we're able to break through into a much bigger sense, which he called participating in fresh perception. And so the last one then is, when we break through, when we hear each other, we hear our, 
very different opinions around the circle of dialogue. We disagree with them. Sometimes we fight about them. What happens is we start developing what's called a shared meaning. And getting under that surface and finding what really most matters is the basis of what dialogue is here for. So I told you the story of the, the guy that was head of maintenance losing the relationship with a patient in the facility where he worked who'd been so close to him for many years, that sense of grieving. What really mattered to him in that moment was coming face to face with the reality of how much he had cared for this person and the deep loss he was gonna feel in that moment. There are a lot of other things that could, could surface in a, in a work situation. I, I had an experience with a, manu, a global manufacturer in Italy a few years back and his, he gathered his team together. We did a, a weekend dialogue with the group and one of the things that came out for them was much to the CEO's shock, they couldn't really tell the boss what really mattered to them because they were so afraid of reprisals. Well, having said that and having broken that spell of fear in an environment where it could be said and recognizing that it was a story that had been built up about the boss that wasn't really true, really opened a whole different opportunity for that manufacturing firm to deal with their, with their vision and their mission. So a lot of things come up that have to do with sharing what really matters most. Now, I think maybe Rosie would recognize this experience. These aren't the actual pictures, but Rosie and I were involved in the International Women's Dialogue for several years. One year we went to India. We were on a little island that was off the shore of Mumbai. And in the mornings we could get up and watch the fishing boats come in. This little island probably hadn't had much change for 400 years. And so in the morning, the fishing boats would come in. They were painted bright pink and green and blue. They were just beautiful coming in. And almost everybody that lived in this little community would rush to the shore and they all had, had a job to do. So some people went aboard the fishing boats with big baskets and they brought in all the things from the fishing nets and they dumped them out at various places across the sand where groups, and I think they must have been family groups, had spread out big cloths and they would sort the things that came out of these baskets. There'd be some sea snakes that came out and they'd throw them in the discard pile and there would be this kind of fish and that kind of fish. And then other people would come along with other baskets and they would take this kind of fish and it would go someplace and they would take that kind of fish and it would go someplace. And within about an hour, it was all done and the ships were going back out with the, the fish that would go over to Mumbai to, to supply the markets and the restaurants. But everybody in that whole group, that whole village, had a job to do. And it took everybody doing their job for the whole to fit together. Now that to me is the picture of shared meaning. There was a communication among every one of those people and that communication had lasted probably a few hundred years. This, this is how we make our livelihood. This is how we work together. This is how we hang together as a community. Now that's really idealistic. Um, not all of us are there. And unfortunately, Bohm said, that shared meaning is like cement. It's what holds the society together. And you could say that it, our present society is some very poor quality cement. If you make a building with very low quality cement, it cracks and falls apart. Right now, we really need the right cement, the right glue, and that is shared meaning. You might say rebuilding shared meaning. And one of David Bohm's teachers, Patrick DeMare, who really coined that term of dialogue, said, in conversation, dialogue goes beyond words and sentences. It goes beyond statements or syllogistic logic. It's what produces meaning. 
dialogue constitutes an ongoing process in both liberating and constraining the mind. It articulates and formulates cosmos out of chaos. So I think that that would be a great, oh, let me just tell you some places to use dialogue. Um, so dialogue isn't what the process you would want for everything. It's got its place. Oh, as I said, it's best for the under the surface issues. But here's some of those under the surface issues where it might generally be useful. So something's broken and nothing seems to fix it. That was the example I gave you from the, the long-term care facility. So it could be where there's so deep polarization that things have become unproductive and there doesn't seem to be a way beyond that. That would be a good use. Now, it can also be things that are positive and very unknown yet. So it could be a startup organization where there's really a great insight about a new business or a new social initiative, but we don't know how to go about it yet. So there's a lot that needs to be flushed out before it can work. It could be, again, that this is something new and you're trying to figure out an actual step forward. I worked with a school, a, a private school in Houston for a while that had been in operation for a while, but they were going to start, they had been K through six and they wanted to move to the higher grades. And so they used dialogue to try to figure out how do we bridge beyond where we've been into some new areas. It could also be where there's a commitment to something that's a very high ideal and there needs to be ongoing exploration. A, a peer of mine used dialogue in a group with, um, that had the goal of working on some new methods of diagnosing a particular illness. So these were all medical um, researchers. And they were finding that their, the whole area was exploding so quickly in terms of new knowledge that they couldn't ever, on one hand, they were never going to be finished, but they had to keep integrating in more and more and more knowledge from new areas. And so they would use dialogue as their way to talk about what they were learning from others and how that might affect their, their own um, ongoing path forward. So here again are just some examples. These are ones I've, I've used in my work and those of you who are consultants and practitioners of dialogue have used it in others. So again, something seems unresolvable and you're trying to figure out what the real issue is. It might be that you're in a setting, now I've seen this used a lot in government settings, to build a network across what might be considered siloed parts of the organization. So you're trying to build across different technologies. Um, a lot of technology, a lot of large companies these days have so many different areas of specialization that, it's, that it takes something like this to build the whole network of the company together. So it could be used as a leadership value, uh, an attitude development process. So I've seen it used a lot with leadership groups to help them really build a tight structure among themselves uh, so that they're all integrated and headed in the same direction. You could use it to anticipate trends that are coming. Um, I used it in one organization where there were real deep status issues that kept the groups from being able to work well together. And that's particularly true in this day and age where you've got CEOs that are making 60 times the wages of the lower level people. Those status issues really build in some fractions. Okay. Uh, building culture. Um, after reorganization, this is a great thing to do after there's been a reorganization. Jeff and I used it a lot as a way of engaging the workforce when we were doing a major change. Um, so I think all these, you know, are examples and the opportunities are certainly as wide as our, our imaginations and as our 
circumstances tend to call for. So I think with that, I should stop. Hopefully some of you who are also involved in dialogue can add to what I've shared. Correct me if I made some errors and ask questions if this is new for you. So I'm gonna turn back to Linda and ask if you could facilitate some conversation amongst us. I would be happy to, Beth, if you take your shared screen down. Oh, yes, yeah, see? And That's my technological incompetence there. Okay. See each other, la voila. All right, there's everyone. So let's see, I don't see any questions in the um, chat box yet. Does anyone have any, oh, okay, Lauren? Remember, you're on mute. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. This was this was really helpful. Um, I I've um, had a fair amount of training with um, essential partners, the formerly public conversations project. So the reflective structure dialogue, which works, is is really focused more on. Um, groups that have a particular tension, right? So I've always wondered how Bohmian dialogue could address that, but um, I really, like some of your examples of the positives really gave me a lot of, it was, it was really helpful to think about how Bohmian dialogue could be used to build on strengths, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'm involved in some organizations right now that are starting up and I, I, I found that really helpful. But I guess I would just ask you, um, how successful, how realistic is it when there, when there's a group that um, is split by a fundamental, impassioned, maybe historical divide? Um, do you use, are there different techniques you would use? Or can you just speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, so in my experience, what I, what I like to start with is first of all doing, oh, an in-depth interview with each participant, particularly when it's when there's that kind of clear divide. Telling the people I'm interviewing that I won't divulge their name, but I would like their permission to share the issues they bring up. And then what I what I like to do is put together a short summary of the major issues that come up from people that I can share with the group beforehand. Now, if it's in a group where there's a hierarchy, then what I found is if I don't have the clear support of whoever's the authority structure, not to do it. Because particularly the more, more fractionated you know that the group is to start with, the more it's gonna flush up stuff that isn't gonna be politically correct to the organizational culture. So making sure I got clear buy off and willingness for the, the head person to engage in that kind of conversation. So if there's people, if there are people who are just so, so deeply embedded uh, and they aren't, they aren't able to consider any other way, I guess I'd reconsider if even dialogue is the way to go there. Sometimes I found that dialogue isn't also, also isn't maybe the way it to go and maybe individuals need some some uh, opportunity to further do their own personal work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, that being said, one of my colleagues did a lot of work in the Baltic area uh, when that whole turmoil supposedly was coming to an end. And what he did was he did uh, some multi-day multi trainings for teenagers where he brought people teenagers from both sides of the conflict together for, I, I've forgotten now, it seems to me it was like a week, and had some sessions where they dialogue around their experience of the war and the impact. Of their experience of what? Sorry. Of the, in the Baltics. Oh, okay. So okay. They, were, they were describing, this is what it was like when I saw my cousin killed. Mm -hmm. you, you can't get any worse than that. Yeah. Now, I don't know just how he structured his whole process, but if you had any interest, I would try to put you in contact with him. Mm -hmm. that, to me, that was one of the most extreme polarities I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. David Bohm himself used dialogue between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, and he put me in contact one time, not he, David Pete did, with one of uh, Bohm's friends who turned out to be Andrew Stone, Lord Andrew Stone, who is a 
in the House of Lords in England. And Andrew Stone used it between the Palestinians and the Israelis to develop contracts for to exchange uh, tomatoes and <laughs> produce hmm. that each side needed. So there are some wonderful examples where the polarity just off the Richter scale. Yeah, that's, that's that's really helpful. Thank you. And I and and I just found that reading Bohm, um, I didn't have a lot of concrete ideas. So again, this has been really helpful. And some of what you just described, the in-depth interviews. Um, is something that's also that reflective structure dialogue, right? They practice beforehand. So, so thank you again for the concrete examples. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? If you just raise your hand, I'll call on you. Okay, let's. Um, sorry, you're uh, Zof, Zofna, right? Yeah. Hi. So um, I'm curious about one aspect that I don't believe you touched on and I was wondering, and I've read Bohm, um, but I, I want to explain, I came to dialogue and even conflict from the perspective of learning and human development. So for me, diversity and multiple voices and our multi-being a multi-dimensional human um, is that what creates, what generates learning and development. Um, so this is what I'm interested in. Um, and I see m many times, and also I think I saw in your presentation, we use dialogue for, for um, to solve a problem. Um, and um, I am more interested in, it's actually, it's the prevention, preventive aspect as to how we get into habits of living in a dialogic way so oh. that we are open, we, are, we do not reject other people because they see things differently. Mm -hmm. So the whole, and you know, and it, it has implications the way I see it has implications, for example, on wholeness. For me, wholeness is not coherence. It's actually multiplicity and how we, we leverage this multiplicity to learn and develop from other points of view. So I was wondering if he, he relates to it, he talks about it, um, because I haven't encountered, and, and I was wondering what you know about that. Uh, lovely perceptions. Thank you for that. Uh, I, it, clearly, he talks about diversity because he thinks that a group, if you get a group of people together and everybody thinks the same, there's not enough stimulation of other thought that it flushes out our own thinking. I mean, what we're trying to do in dialogue is bring our own thinking the, to the fore so that we get more exposure to what we want to keep in ourselves. Like you said, the growth is gonna come from the diversity. So clearly he says that. Um, I'm not aware, and maybe Linda or others would know of, I think he would clap if, he, if he's up there somewhere clap, listening to this, he'd be clapping at what you're saying because it is such a possibility for growth that I don't, know exactly in his writing where I could guide you. Mm -hmm. What I would say is my finding is that if you if you go into his science as well as into what he writes about dialogue, there's an awful lot that's said on the sci side of science that filters into his thinking about dialogue. And also, uh, I think as those who came in from the root of Krishnamurti would see that there's a lot there that might guide us. Let me think though, and if I have your contact mm -hmm. information, if I find something, I'll send you. Yeah, I know he was interested in complexity, but for me, the learning and multiplicity is more connected to, um, to uh, complexity than coherence, because I would like to allow people not to be coherent, to try to explore and yeah. uh, be, you know, be blurred and uncertain at, at times. And 
there are many more things like I involve respect in it because respect is looking back. So it allows you to keep to having the patience to mm -hmm. hear people and have people present themselves over and over again so that you get their wholeness instead of coherence, you know? Right. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really lovely. I really like that. So I just yeah. add one little thing because Beth, you did mention that he does come from a uh, a quantum science perspective and that's what you're really bringing up he, he used to always talk about the universe being holographic in nature so okay. what you're really bringing up is the microcosm of the macrocosm so from, from from Bohm's point of view what you bring up is vital because you know we do if you get enough people 12 plus people together suddenly we start to see the whole if we're all sharing Right, mm -hmm. and that's how we can learn this larger thing. So the learning is absolutely essential, and yeah. most groups, of course, come together without learning from each other first, and then they try to make decisions, and that's why the decisions don't go well because they haven't learned from everyone first. Mm -hmm. So thank you for bringing that up. That's that was a great question and observation. So other questions, thoughts? Yes. Um, and I'm sorry. Let's see. Your name is Paul, and you're on mute. Hi, it's Paul here in Johannesburg. Um, sorry if we were late we were traffic and I think we got the time zone earlier. Um, but I'm a Quaker and I think one of the things that Quakers do dialogically is we come to the circle prepared. Um, so it's a preparedness of heart and mind. Um, and what I often see is that when, when dialogues are convened, people rock up, they sit down, and then they start preparing. But what happens in other groups that I'm involved in, you prepare beforehand. And for me, the most important preparation is the willingness to be wrong mm -hmm. and the willingness to change my ideas, have a look at my thunks, um, actually think in real time. And I think it comes back to the earlier contributor saying, how do I live a dialogic life? Mm -hmm. And that means continuously being in dialogue with myself. I was in traffic earlier on, somebody uh, beeped their horn behind me, and for about a kilometer, my ego wanted to fight. And I realized, what does my ego really want here? So I have to be continuously in dialogue with myself. Mm. Well said. Well said. And welcome from South Africa. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And, and also, I want to welcome Tom Kotner from, oh, is it Brazil or Argentina? You're on mute. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina at the yeah. moment. Welcome. And, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your welcome and, and uh, very much looking forward to to get him to know this group. Thank you. And Mino, I noticed you had a question. You're on mute. I have done a lot of work with uh, Palestinians and Jews and Israelis in Manhattan and used uh, this work, a bomb approach. And what we've been able to do is get to the point of where you at least humanize each other, mm. where at least you begin to see that this is an individual, it's human, and they're not some, you know, remote alien group that can be targeted mm. and killed. So the, the dialogue helps you get to that basic level, whether we reach coherence or wholeness, it doesn't matter. It's just that basic thing and then I run the Bergen County Interfaith Women's Initiative and the Jews Muslim Christian women getting together and the same thing they'll say oh I never met a Muslim um, it's so interesting that you're so interesting you know as if that was not possible before in their mental model oh. so wow. it's, it's very powerful and I would not give up on dialogue in even those uh, what Lauren called very uh, very, very, you know, impassioned uh, uh, situations. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Welcome to Beth Herman. I noticed you came on. She Hello. She's speaking to us in a minute about the academy. Okay. 
Any other questions? Thoughts? Yes, Paul, and you're on mute. You're on mute. A uh, question. In your experience, when does dialogue not work? When does it just not work? Because I know David Peet said to uh, David uh, Shrum one time, he said, I don't think this dialogue shit works at all. <laughs> That's a good one. Do you want to respond, Beth? I can respond. <laughs> he did. He used to say that to me a lot, too. So not everybody that was associated with David Bohm thought he was doing a great thing. Some of his scientist friends thought he was totally out of his mind. And in fact, uh, Paul and I were at the centennial celebration of David Bohm's birth last September in Pari, Italy. And it was just really fascinating because the, the still living, um, Colleagues of David Bohm were there presenting things that that they they wanted to say about David Bohm's um, science. But at one point, Basil Hiley was was there, and Basil was a good friend and his co-author on much of Bohm's work. And so somebody else said to them, "You know, it was really interesting because David Bohm used to say to me." I'm going to go to a Krishnamurti thing, but don't you dare tell Basil. And so Basil says, I knew it the whole time. I know exactly what he was doing. <laughs> so so there, was, there was all this controversy about, uh, let's not talk about it, but David Bohm, the scientist, is doing weird things out there with the human stuff. So clearly not everybody was in alignment. And David Pete was one of them. I think from what I understand, there's there was some, uh, confusion early on. Uh, Stephanie, could you take your screen sharing off? Yeah, somebody. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 So there was, I think there, there was some difficulty in the startup of dialogue in the sense that David Bohm had his idea of something that he was wanting to create. And I think that Peter Garrett is an unsung hero here. I think Peter really helped Bohm develop a methodology of dialogue that Bohm wouldn't have been able to do by himself. But I think when you hear people, some of these early folks that talk about how they didn't like it, like David Pete, I think what you were seeing was the process of dialogue coming into being. And there were some things they did that didn't work. If, if you've done any kind of change work, you know, sometimes you do something and it just goes flat. So I think there was this, this process of ramping up the methodology to where it came to work. And I think that's where a lot of the turmoil comes. But I would say in, in dialogues I've done, and I can just speak from my experience and the rest of you share them, I think there's some people that just really aren't able to release the rigidity of their thinking. That they need something besides just sitting in the dialogue circle before they can get to the point of being open enough to even listen to other people. And I don't know what else to say about that. I, I, I think there are some people who are spoilers. I don't know. I'd love to hear the rest of you say, what have you done that works when you've got somebody who's really antagonistic and uh, really not willing to participate in a dialogical way? What, what, what have some of the rest of you done? Well, I can, I can comment. Um, I've had not too many, but I have had in trainings people who were forced to go by their management because their management was saying, you need to listen, you, you know, you really need this dialogue program. Well, they would come in and be incredibly antagonistic. And you know, that old saying that one bad apple will spoil the, the, the barrel. Um, finally, the woman left uh, after it was two out of a four and a half day retreat. It was two grueling days. And I think sometimes if the person is coming where they are um, forced to come, they're not going to be open from the get go. And so sometimes you just have to let them go. 
that that's that's I can remember that one experience and that that really helped the rest of the group understand the importance of that need for openness and that uh, how rigidity and holding what uh, tightly to one's opinions just is anathema to dialogue. So it actually deepened the group's experience, even though we had one person that had to be. So that was one experience I can remember. What about doing, um, I'm sorry, I have forgotten. I have, I can't say your name. But in having done dialogue with Palestinian and Israeli and Christian women, did you, did you tend to have uh, people who are so polarized that you had to do something in addition just to the dialogue? Yeah, I would uh, occasionally have people who just had to walk away. Uh -huh. They self-selected them out of the circle because uh, it was too difficult for them to get that. We never tried to deal one-on-one -on -one with them because our whole purpose was to create um, you know, a dialogue circle. Mm -hmm. But I think I've seen it in corporate settings too. Sometimes those who are the most anti uh, the approach will then become the most converted. You know, they're, they're, you have to dig deeper. So I've tried that as well, talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody who is resisting change at a corporate level. And when you finally hear them, when they feel understood, mm -hmm. then they're ready to be listening to others. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. first do that work and maybe that's what Paul meant there's preparatory work that might be called for in some cases yeah I, I found too that the hierarchical uh, orientation of a group uh, can cause problems so if you can um, convince whoever is the uh, the power person in the group that um, you, you know you talk to them they fully understand what dialogue is and then they model that openness it does wonders for the whole group. If they don't model it, it can be quite troublesome. Uh, Lauren, I'll mute you here. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um, I was just gonna say too, one thing that we've been thinking about, um, I'm involved in starting a, um, a center devoted to cultural engagement and dialogue in the arts and have been looking at a variety of um, examples of artistic engagement that would sort of function as a pre-dialogic, there's actually um, pre-dialogic encounter, there's an organization, there's organization in our area called Arts Bridge that actually brings uh, artists, um, Israelis and Palestinians to together, uh, for example, um, musicians, um, so, or in local communities just to have food together. Um, so trying to get away from something that's so um, oriented around words, I guess. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So um, I'm just noticing that um, Tacey has uh, said a few things in the uh, chat, and then I'm going to ask for Beth to tell us a little bit about the Academy, and we'll do some quick checkouts, uh, uh, just looking at the time factor. So Tacey uh, says, here's a practical issue. I'm curious how you present the dialogue process to potential participants to build, whoops, I lost it, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, away from me. Uh, to, uh, to build buy-in to the process, there's a lot that might be seen as non-traditional or even off the wall in conventional organizational settings. So Beth, do you want to handle that one? So how do you get buy-in to the process? What's the most, what's the well, easiest way? Yeah, I think uh, Paul, Woody, and I were having a conversation about this some time back. I've not ever found that it really works a whole lot to try to sell dialogue, per se. I remember uh, when I was using it in corporate environments, especially if there's a highly scientific orientation of the group, that if you say, I, at first I thought I can say, here's David Bohm, who is a quantum physicist, da 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 da, and it would be a, a fit for them. What happened was that all the scientists went out and researched his physics and came into the dialogue and said, well, I didn't like this, that, or the other. <laughs> so, uh, I think what is really valuable, and particularly, that's one reason why I like to start with doing interviews with everyone, is to tap into what the central issue is that they want to address in the work setting or the whatever the setting is. And then, not sometimes I don't even tell them it's dialogue, we just do it. Yeah. So, to get some, some 
agreement on what it is that is of most concern to people and then say, let's just pull our chairs around together here and talk about this. So the more you wrap language around it at times, the more difficult it is to be able to quote sell it because it's, it's got too much objectivity to it. You just do it. Yeah. That's very good. So in the interest of time, there's a few more comments in the chat box. I uh, encourage everyone to read those. Um, Beth, would you want to say a few words about the Academy? Uh, what's going on both in Europe and in the U S and then we'll do a quick close. Yeah, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the International Academy of Professional Dialogue. Um, this is an organization that was established by uh, Peter Garrett, who um, Beth Macy just referenced. Um, the idea was that when Peter set this up is he felt that we needed an organization at an international level of practitioners of dialogue. Um, and Peter himself has done a lot of work. He's based out of England. Um, so he reached out to a few of his colleagues in different countries, Germany, Norway, um, uh, Sweden, a few other places, and then of course the United States. And he contacted um, my husband and I, and we said, yes, we'd be very interested in, in helping with the US Academy. To date, we had one meeting, um, and we have a presence on the met, on the website. That's about all we've done. We haven't really gotten off the ground. We're in the process of looking into a 501c3 for the US Academy. But I would encourage you, if you haven't, please check out the website, the International Academy of Professional Dialogue. You can Google it, it comes up. Um, see what some of the goals are, what the objectives are of the organization. Again, the idea is that it'll be actually practitioners of dialogue um, not really people who are learning new skills, but those who are currently in the field um, is who we're trying to attract. We are, um, there is now a membership fee. I want to say it's 150, I think, a year. I think that's right. It's around 100 or 150 U.S. Um, to join, which in, includes both the U.S. Academy and the International Academy. Um, as we move forward in the next few years, we hope to grow the U.S. Academy. We're not in a growth phase yet, but we, we want to get people who are interested so we can have sessions like this where practitioners can get together and talk about what they're doing, ways to help each other, have um, communities of practice um, where we can talk amongst each other doing similar things. Because I don't know that that organization actually does exist, those who are practitioners of dialogue in the United States. Um, so please look at our website, see what you think, um, reach out to Beth Macy or Linda Eleanor or myself or even my husband, James Herman. Our emails are all on there. If you have any questions or you'd like to get involved, um, we'd certainly like to have you join our group. And just a quick announcement, uh, uh, someone has asked where they might get some training in dialogue. Uh, Beth and I are going to submit a proposal through NCDD for a pre-conference one day training. So if any of you are interested in that, please look at that. It'll be on the NCDD uh, website, hopefully soon, as soon as they announce the sessions. When, so, is the, when is the NCDD meeting? It's early November. It's gonna be in Denver this year. I think it's, um, oh. don't quote me, it's, I think it's like the fourth through the eighth, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but if you get on their website, it's just Google NCDD and then go to events and it'll show all of that. That's so, a great idea. idea. Yeah, National Coalition of Dialogue and Delivery. Right. Yeah. In fact, I'll put it. I'll put the uh, put it here in the chat. And Beth Herman, could you also just say a little bit about the October conference? Sure. Um, there is going to be a conference in Rocky Park, England, which is east of London, um, October fifteenth through seventeenth. Three days of dialogue professionals. We are encouraging anybody who wants to attend to please join us. We're probably gonna have different, um, different topics, healthcare, um, the prison system, a correction system. Um, I think we're still looking at some of the other education topics. It's the first conference, but we really love attendance. We are gonna limit attendance at no more than 80 participants. Um, but if you're interested, that is also on the website, and we really, really encourage people to attend the conference if they're interested. Thanks so much. So listen, I'm going to unmute everyone. Um, 
are unmuted. It says you're all unmuted, but it looks like you're all muted. So why don't you all unmute yourself? Uh, that didn't work so well. Work so well. And um, if anyone would like to just simply reflect on the process, let's just go around very quickly. Just popcorn style, I'll call on you. Any final comments, thoughts? Otherwise, we'll close up. Beth, have you um, written something? I'd love to um, find out more about, especially ways to use dialogue instead of helping organizations um, think through operationalizing steps for next, for the future. Um, I haven't written anything that specific. I don't know about Linda if I might have. Yes, actually, I'm preparing some research. I think, Lauren, you know that. Um, I'm interviewing right now people who have long-time uh, backgrounds in dialogue. If any of you do, please reach out to me. I'm uh, writing a, a paper that I'll present at the conference, and I'm also writing a book about the personal transformation that takes place when people integrate dialogue deeply into their, into their life work. It's sort of like dialogue as a way of life. We'll talk about that on the um, oh, okay. program. So please, if you feel you, you'd like to be interviewed, I'd love to interview you. <laughs> Um, any other comments before we close? It's so wonderful to see you all. Yes, Paul? Paul, oh, you're um, muted. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of things we're testing here in South Africa. We'd like to keep you informed. Um, one of them is um, related to SOMA significance. Oh, I was fascinated by bombs. Ref reference to it, but not really doing anything about it. So we got some clients who will be doing a two and a half day dialogue. We'll be adding in a half day in advance where they will have five 40 minute therapy sessions. Neurodologist, a body scan, a massage, a talk therapist, and a cleaning process. So that by the time we get them into the dialogue, We've been promised by Dr. Rob Cowling, who's put the protocol together. They'll be really ready to drop. So we're happy to share some of that. Oh, That's great. Very interesting. And secondly, digital transformation. It's a buzzword in, in business at the moment. We are creating for a client gamified dialogue. So after you've been in your dialogue session, you enter a gamification with your mobile phone where if you are dialogic, you can honor yourself. And if I've seen you being dialogic in the business, I can honor you and there's a system and a leaderboard. And so it extends the dialogic ecosystem using mobile phone and laptops and there's a leaderboard and there will be prizes. So happy to keep you informed about how to extend dialogue using technology. Oh. I think it's important for millennials. Um, Fascinating. Because, uh, they, they live their lives on the social media uh, platform. So happy to keep you guys informed about our early experiments here in South Africa. That's yeah. fabulous. That's great. Well, we're going past the hour. Any other final comments? We're going to have to say adieu. All right. Well, listen, I'm so happy you all came. It's been a wonderful experience. Thanks to Beth and Beth Herman. I'm glad you could join us too. And we hope to do this more often. It's been one of my um, uh, visions to have ongoing dialogues uh, that we, where, where we can talk about issues that are, are very complex by people Thank who you. understand something about dialogue. So hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye now. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.